So he invited me back to his table. I asked for a cranberry juice. He bought me the cranberry juice. Then he cheers me, clinks my glass. He says, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. And now I'm baffled. Like, how can that be? <laughs> I've sat down with anybody and everybody from all over the world. And he's never sat down with a black man before. So I said, why? Long story short, he tells me he's a member of the KKK. But why do you think as a Christian, there are people who believe that they love God, but they don't love all people? Why do they think that it's possible to be that way as a child, son or daughter of God? Because they have been brainwashed into believing that certain people are, are not the children of God, but they are the children of Satan. And, you know, I, I've dealt a lot with members of the Ku Klux Klan, for example. And they, and they believe that, um, that God's children are white children. <laughs> you know, and, and we people, black people, are, are sub-children. So, you know, and you know, people make up, make up this stuff. Yeah. First of all, race, race is a man-made construct. There's no such thing as the black race, the white race. You know, we say that, but really there's no such thing. There's one race, it is a human race. Within that human race, there are different colors. Right. I want to ask you about uh, your visit, your relationship with the Klansmen that you started a long time ago. So you're sitting around, and one day you decided, let me go play with the Klansmen. How did that happen? How did that come about way when you first started this? Well, um, we, we have to go way back to my childhood. <laughs> uh, I, I grew up as the son of parents in the United States Foreign Service, State Department. So I grew up as an American embassy kid, traveling all over the world, yeah. starting at the age of three. And how it works is you get assigned to a country for two years, you're there, you come back home here to the States, you're here for a little while, you get assigned to another country for two years. So every two years, I was in different countries, starting at the age of three. My first exposure to school was overseas. I lived in Africa for 10 years. I lived in Europe. All right. Um, my first exposure to school was overseas. I did kindergarten, first grade, third grade, fifth grade, seventh grade. And in between, I was here. Um, my classes in these foreign countries, my classmates were from Nigeria, Japan, Russia, Czechoslovakia, France, Germany, Italy. Anybody who had an embassy in those countries, all of their children went to the same school. Oh, yeah. So uh, I had what, what today we call a multicultural environment. The term multicultural didn't even exist back then. To me, it was just a norm. Everybody was different. Maybe we didn't, we didn't look alike. We didn't speak the same language. Maybe we didn't worship alike. But we all got along. All right? I never experienced racism until I would come home, back here to my own country. And I, I couldn't understand it. How can I go around the world and be treated as an equal and then be treated as a second-class citizen back in, you know, back in my own country? That was baffling to me. So skipping ahead, um, I, well, I formed a question in my mind after some people threw rocks and bottles at me because I was the only black Cub Scout in an, in an all-white Cub Scout parade. I didn't understand it because I'd never experienced that before. So my question that I formed at the age of 10 was, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? Yeah. And I've been looking for the answer to that question. I'm still looking today, which is why I still deal with KKK and neo-Nazis and anybody else. But um, and race, you know, nobody has a monopoly on racism. You know, there are races anywhere and everywhere. So one day I graduated from uh, from school with my degree, as you put it, in jazz. And uh, I was playing country music and I was in a country band because country music was very popular. And I was the only black person in the band, the only black person in many of the bars where we would play. And we played a place in a town called Frederick, Maryland which is about an hour and 20 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. The, the uh, bar was called the Silver Dollar Lounge. And the Silver Dollar Lounge had a reputation of being an all-white or whites-only type bar. There were no signs that said no, no blacks or no colored or whatever, nothing like that. But you knew if you were black, you were not welcome there. So, you know, when you go somewhere where you're not welcome and alcohol is being served, it's not a good combination. <laughs> That's right. right. That's right. So... Uh, the band had played there before, and I had just joined the band, so it's my first time there. And um, we got done playing the first set. We're taking a break. I'm following the band over to the band table, 
And I feel somebody from behind come up and put their arm around my shoulder. Now, I don't know anybody in here, right? I see the whole band in front of me walking this way. So I'm turning around trying to see who's touching me. It was this uh, white gentleman. I would say 15, 18 years older than me. Big smile. And he says, hey, you know, I really enjoy your all's music. I said, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I shook his hand. And, he's, and he points at the stage and he says, I've seen this here band before, but I ain't never seen you. Where'd you come from? And I explained, I just joined the band a couple months ago. It's my first time here. He says, man, I sure love your piano playing. This is the first time I ever heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. Well, I was not offended, but I was rather surprised that this guy being at least a decade and a half older than me, he did not know the black origin of Jerry Lee Lewis's piano style. And I began to tell him, hey, Jerry Lee got it from the same place I did, from black, blues, and boogie-woogie piano players. That's where that rockabilly, rock and roll style came from. Right. Oh, no, 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 no. I ain't never seen no black man play like that except for you. So I'm, I'm thinking, well, look, man, you never saw Little Richard or Fast Domino? It's the same style. I said, Jerry Lee Lewis is a very good friend of mine. We've done many shows together. He's told me himself he used to go see these black people across the tracks at a place called Haney's Big House which was a black bar where they bring in these blues and boogie woogie players. And that's what influenced him. Well, he didn't believe I knew Jerry Lee Lewis either, but he was fascinated with me because he'd never seen this before. Yeah. I was a black person. Yeah. So he invited me back to his table and he bought me, uh, I, I asked for a cranberry juice. He bought me the cranberry juice and then he cheers me, clinks my glass. He says, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. And now I'm baffled. Like, how can that be? <laughs> I've sat down with anybody and everybody from all over the world. You know, and he's never sat down with a black man before. So I said, why? Long story short, he tells me he's a member of the KKK. Whoa. So that's where that started. Yeah. Nice. And so I, I want, and we're going to tell the people before we leave today how to get and see your videos because they really are amazing. Join your, at the meetings of the KKK when they were burning the crosses and all that. Let me just ask, because of time here, when you were at the Klansmen's meetings, when they would burn the cross and they would have on the outfit, the yes. things, were you Absolutely. nervous at all that maybe, even though you were friends with at least one, a couple of them, were you nervous that you would be attacked by the others out in the woods like that? No, and I'll tell you why. Because there are two kinds of Klan rallies. There's a public rally, and then there, there are private rallies. Okay, a public rally, they have to go to City Hall, get a permit to, to be in the park, and light their cross or, you know, have, have a permit, right? So if, if it's a public park, anybody can go. You can go, I can go, anybody can right. go. Now, if there's going to be trouble, there's a barrier of police between the protesters and the Klan, right? If there's no trouble, you just walk up there and, you know, voice your opinion, say hello, whatever you want to do. If it's a private rally, it's held on some member's property, and you must be invited by the Klan to attend those. Oh, okay. So I've, I've been to both. I've been to the ones that are public. I've been to the ones that I've been invited to. And the chain of command, the Grand Dragon, the Imperial Wizard, okay, if they invite you, regardless of what any other member thinks about you or says, they cannot do anything to you. It's a chain of command. They That's must a, obey their leader. Amazing. And so over the years, have you had good success with um, influencing them to overcome a hate and realize we're all the same? I've had, I've, had, I've had a good deal of success, yes. Not everybody's going to change. Right. But you know what, though? I never set out to change anybody. It wasn't my mission to go to the Klan and say, hey, you're wrong, you need to give me your robe and hood and, and leave this ideology behind. I went to them to try to understand how they arrived at this ideology. Nice. Because I, I knew it was not... A a a, an, uh, a natural behavior. They didn't. They were not born with it. It was a learned behavior. So wh where do they learn it from? So what can be learned can be unlearned. And just in conversations with these people, not overnight, but over time, they began seeing the humanity in me, as opposed to seeing me as a child of Satan or whatever they considered me. Yeah. And they began rethinking. So I was the impetus for them to convert themselves. A lot of the media says, oh, you know, black musician converts X number of KKK white supremacists. No, I didn't convert anybody. I didn't even convert one. I am the impetus for more than 200 
to convert themselves. Right. But not everybody's going to change. That's Some right. will go to their grave being hateful and violent. 